You were talking about personality and behavior. Yeah, so I was kind of trying to go into, you know, in your opinion, because you're, you're the expert in this scenario, I'm definitely not. It seems like a lot of the times, especially from what you had just said right there, it seems as though, you know, personality and behavior, they get blended together, right? And it seems as though there, there is a significant difference between the two, especially when it comes to the hiring process, right? And you said it can even go as deep as marriages, right? You know, why? It's, it's, it's just shocking to me because the companies that you work with that do use the DISC behavioral assessment, right? They seem to be doing fantastic, right? And, and I would like to, I would really be curious to see what the differences are between companies that do use the DISC behavioral assessment and the ones who don't, right? In your opinion, do you feel like there is kind of a difference or a fluctuation there between the companies that do and don't use the DISC, you know, behavioral assessment? I, I think there is, Colin, and one of the reasons I, 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 I guess it's kind of a study, but I do have one client that uh, it's a university and we have a, a, a DISC for admission counselors, for directors of admissions, for adjunct professors, for uh, academic advisors, for uh, bursars or financial aid officers. And uh, when I do the DISC profile for a financial aid officer, if I have someone who's a very high D and a very low I, and with a very dominant and not very cautious or compliant or detail oriented, they wouldn't make a good financial aid officer. Right. You're talking <laughs> with a student who wants to know about financial aid. So I would recommend they not be hired for that position. By the same token, if someone who's uh, a very high uh, D but a very low I uh, for an admission counselor, their, their job is to be able to, to, to guide students to become a student or not. They, they get incoming calls from ads and whatnot. And I noticed, uh, and we have people that stay, well, I, I had one the other day, I said, if you don't hire her, I will. <laughs> she was that good. And uh, I send it back and I put my recommendation on a scale of zero to 10 for that position. And sometimes I'll get one that would say, not a good admission counselor, but might be a good financial aid officer. Oh, okay. So I think the way I've noticed it is that my, my university does not advertise as often for admission counselor positions as some of the other local universities do. So which tells me they're having a lot of turnover or they're not hiring the right mm. people. It's kind of a Bernie study, just a visual study. Yeah. But, but my client has been utilizing this for over 12 years, and uh, I believe last month I did about 25 uh, different uh, bursar, financial aid officer, admission counselor. It doesn't matter what the position is. And I have one for, uh, which is a, a sales profile for admission counselor, but I have an employee manager profile for other positions. I have a customer service profile. I have an executive profile for someone who's an executive, or you're going to uh, promote someone to be the CEO. Sure. So I've got the whole menu of, of, <laughs> of services there, and it, it's a, it's and, and then uh, and and oftentimes people will ask me, can I have my profile? And I'll say no, but uh, because it's the it's the client. But I always advise my clients if they do hire someone, show them, give them that profile, 24 pages. It'll say how to best communicate with me. Um, how not, don't communicate with me, uh, areas for improvement. Uh, it's a really 24 page of, of unbelievable. I tell them, share it with your family, you know, and then share it with each other. So if you're a high I and you're, hey, you know, and you're dealing with a high D and you know each other, at least you know how to deal with one another. Sure. So it's a, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, here's all about me, here's how to, you know, you want to pick me up, honey, here's how, here's what I, you know, here, here's, here's my hot spots. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. Hey, Bernie, if worse comes to worse, you can just say nice glutes and that, that, that'll do the job. <laughs> that will do the job. Yeah, that'll do the job. But no, that, that's so interesting, Bernie, you know, because that's, it's, it, I'm trying to think of the right way to describe it, it's just so curious to me, right? It's, it seems like a lot of companies are, are, are missing 
the details, right? Yes. They're missing the yes. details, right? And, and one thing it seems like you capitalize on is the details, right? And it, it, if you were to give, you know, what would be one thing that you would do for, you know, like, like say there was a company that was struggling in, in maybe turnover of, of yeah. clients or turnover of employees, right? What would be a strategy or a technique that you would do to try to like analyze that, try to find yeah. the details? Good question. I have a very large roofing company, <clears throat> client of mine, and what I would do, what I did with them is I profiled all of their sales team. I think it was nine or ten people. And I went back to the uh, owner and I said, uh, I got good news and bad news. He said, what's the bad news? I said, you've got to, uh, I never fire anyone, I return them to the labor market. So, <laughs> you have to return most of your sales team to the labor market. He said, what's the good news? I said, I'll help you hire new ones. Uh, since I've been working with this company, the sales have gone from $7 million to $84 million in the last eight years. And they will tell you Bernie's story about good, and they don't hire anyone without doing the profile. And is it always 100%? No. You know, sometimes it, it doesn't pick up about 2% of the time. That's a, that's it's a, not bad. That's a darn good percentage. You can, you can roll with but, that. But 52% of the time when it says not hireable, they're not hireable. And then what is it called? I wrote an article called The Profit is in the Hire. We hire for skills and fire for attitude. Mm. Think about that. So don't you want to know that person before you... Uh, I call it hiring John Wayne on Friday and Woody Allen comes in on Monday. <laughs> 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 I thought he was a stud. Oh, he was a studist. Yeah, right. You know? And I've done it. We've all done it. And you know, my question for you, Vern, is to to have a system that's that's so detail oriented and is, is so kind of rock solid in the sense of you know what you're looking for, you know what you're trying to accomplish. You know, clearly that, that must have taken, you know, years. Of, of, of refining, you know, and yes. learning through trial and error and things of that nature, you know, how, how did you stay steady, right? How did you stay in, in your lane, for lack of better terminology, and have the confidence to know that, that what I'm doing is going to work and I'm just kind of working through the kinks right now? Well, the way I did that, and sometimes, you know, you, especially if you interview someone, you really like them, you know, you hire people like you, uh, I just taught myself and trained myself to be totally objective, to put myself up in the corner looking at this person as would they or would they not succeed in this position on a scale of zero to ten. And then I would put my eight in there, I had one nine, never given ten, but I had a nine point two the other day. Ah. And I've had some to three or four. And I put do not hire. Or hireable with reservations if they were marginal. So it helps me to be another set of eyes for them as well. I had one of my clients uh, who's the, uh, uh, he has one of the largest truck centers, Atlantic Trucks, and they have uh, uh, large trucks that they have, they sell trucking. Okay. And this gentleman at uh, one time owned an NFL football team. Wow. I mean, he's very, and he said to me, and he, he's an elderly gentleman, he had a typewriter, he said, Bernie, I'm sick and tired of hiring these effing retreads. I'll teach him about trucks, you teach him about sales. And here's a guy, 87 years old, took him all that time, and he said, you know, I, I said, I, I said to him, I said, Skip, so these people, they maybe have 20 years experience, or do they have one year's experience 20 times? Mm -hmm. And they look at me and say, oh my God. Sure, they've been doing it, but... They've been all over the place. All over the place, and they're marginal. Right. right. And I'm very, let's, let's dive into something that it's on topic, but just a little bit off, off pace in the sense of, because one thing about you that I have got exposed to, you know, working with you through therapy, is, is you're very specific about terminology, right? It's not a test, it's an assessment. Exactly. Right? Have you worked, have you had 20 years of experience, or do you have one year of experience 20 times, right? And that, that's a very powerful thing, right? Because what that tells me 
is that you've been able to take control of your mind, right? You've been able to take control of your attitude and you figured out how to make it work for you, not against you, right? Yeah. And, and there's a very big difference between the two because a lot of times you'll see people where their attitude, their mindset, their behavior will work them and it'll work against them a lot of the times instead yeah. of the person understanding how they function, understanding what they need to do to take control of their mind, yeah. right? And then turning that into an asset, turning that into a tool to be effective, right? For you, what were some of the things that you did or what, what would you attribute to your level of growth and your level of being able to you know, take control of your mind, understanding the mindset, understanding how you function, right? And being able to kind of use that as a tool to be effective in whatever you want to do in life. Because I think that mindset and attitude, those are the two things that every single day you can always control. Those are the only two yeah. controllables that you do. Every day you wake up in the morning, those are the only two things you can control in life is your mindset and your attitude. And a lot of people don't even do that, right? So how did you kind of learn how to take control of those things and use them to your advantage? I think what I did is I learned to uh, not prioritize my schedule, but schedule my priorities. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I refer back to the story that I heard about a gentleman by the name of Ivy Lee, and he was hired by Andrew Carnegie, one of the wealthiest men in the world, uh, to improve his, his own performance. And Ivy Lee had him right on the board, the seven most important things he had to do. Then he had him going on the board in order of priority, those seven most important things. And Andrew Carnegie attributes his success to being able to prioritize, schedule his priorities, not prioritize his schedule. What's important? What, you know, it's nice to do what you need to do, but what must I do? Okay? And, uh, if one of the things that I uh, have on the back of my phone says, the call you make first is the call you want to make least. Mm. Think about that. Ah, I'm going to call this guy, I don't want to call him, ah, it's probably not a good time. Ah, I'll call him later. Whereas you just make the call and all of a sudden you feel better. It's not an energy vampire. I've got it out of the way. Done. And wow. Just, and usually they're not as mad at me as I thought they would, might be. Right. You know, but it's up in my head. So the call you make first, it's one of my nine rules, is the call you want to make least. So I think it's what, what it's, it's done is, is prioritizing my behaviors as opposed to what I'd like to do, as opposed to what I need to do to reach my goals and objective for that day. So, uh, and when I was training, and what I still do, I used to have on the, my door going out of the office, a paper in the fax machine and shut off the copy machine, a little sticky. Then one day, some 25 years ago, I had a genius attack, which is when I had a good idea. <laughs> and I put, on the, I put on the wall, one more call. So when I left my office for 20 years, I made one more dial. It's 220 dials a year I would not have made. Whether I got a connect or not, it didn't matter. Just go back, make that one guy. So that's scheduling the priorities. Okay, another rule that I have that I train my clients is the three by nine rule. Make three calls before nine every day and you'll grow, you'll grow your business 20% without question. Bernie's rule. I had a client of mine who had three by nine three times. He called three different time zones. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I but, like that. The, 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 those, those kind of rules are, you know, uh, and stick by it. Right. And, and one thing you had said there, Brian, and one thing that really kind of resonated with me and what you were saying was, is the almost simplified in a sense is it, it's not underestimating the significance of the small stuff. Right? Yeah. The small stuff is what was what leads up to the big outcome. Right? And and pretty much from what I took from that, you know, the three by nine rule, it three calls are not a big deal, but the compound effect, doing that every single day, it's just something small. Yep. But you do that, like you had said, one more call, 
That's 220 more calls you would have made. Yeah. You never know what that can yield, right? And, and I think part of the problem is, is that some people get so focused on the big goal that they don't understand that it, it's, it's the small stuff that yeah. gets you to the big goal. They lose sight of how to get there. They're just looking at the end game. They're not looking at the small, seemingly insignificant things they have to do to walk forward towards that goal. Yeah. Right. And you look, and you look back and you say, "Hey, that was that call I made to that guy from Cisco Foods, which I did one time." And you know, so you never, you, you just. Uh, so I think those are the things that I've learned. Uh, one of the other things that. Uh, just to backtrack on the disc profile again, mm -hmm. one of the things I developed about well, maybe five years ago is called the forensic sales process audit. Um, in other words, companies have audits on their books, their inventory. Nobody ever audits their sales team. So I go in as a, as a, uh, and go in and meet with members of the sales team, members of the management team, sales management individually. No, no two people. And I find out about the culture, which is important to me, missions, uh, the relationship with the, with the uh, boss. Uh, the, 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 I find out an awful lot, and I do a disk profile. And then I come back with a written uh, observation of what I found and an oral presentation to the top management. Here, is it, here it is, here's 10 pages of, you know, of what your company is. And uh, it's amazing what, what, how that reveals, you know, what the culture of the company is important, uh, how the people feel about it, and the disc profile. And one of the things that I found also in these forensic profiles is, for many, many years, the top producer in many firms has more room for growth than the bottom producer. And yet top management leaves our top producer over here, we go spend all this time hmm. on the bottom level, whereas these guys can take our company to it. It's amazing that I've, I've seen that. Now, why did they do that? Because uh, they get, well, they feel, well, I, I hired this guy, so I'll work on him to make him like Jim, like, here, like Joe, whereas Jim probably doesn't have all the stuff that Joe has, and Joe can grow a whole lot more just by coaching him, mentoring him, you know, training this guy, but, you know, leadership is about, you know, recruiting, hiring, coaching, training, mentoring, growing new people. And uh, Jack Welsh had the right idea, I guess, and he had, he had, at GE, he mandated that the bottom 10% be terminated every year in all of his different divisions. Wow. Yeah, most people don't know that, but I knew a, a, a manager who had to, let someone go. He didn't want to let go, but he was in the bottom 10% of producers. But that was his philosophy. It worked out pretty well. Okay. And that's the thing, you know, the, uh, the common person will not understand uncommon thought processes. Very true. Very good. And oftentimes, the people, the people who do things in life are uncommon. The thought yeah. process is not common, right? And to be in the 2%, you have to be willing to be misunderstood by the 98%. Right, and that's a perfect example. You it's know, <laughs> that's a perfect example. You know, Brady, let's kind of switch gears because I don't want to eat up all of your time. Okay. Got a lot. You're gonna see a couple boxes in a little circle. So over here, this is gonna be a playlist with a whole bunch of other videos that I posted. If you like what you saw so far from the sit down, you'll be able to keep up with everything right there. Right here is gonna be the video to my previous video, and then right here, click that circle there. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that bell icon to make sure you get all the updates whenever I come out with some new content. I appreciate the support. Let's keep the train going. Here we go.